Well, welcome uh, everybody to the ABA Brown, Bu Brown Bag Lunch uh, talk today. Um, the Gender Equity Initiative is bringing that this to you, and we do this every month. Uh, we are really excited about this talk today. Uh, today, we have three different guests, well, three different guests talking to us. Um, I want to introduce uh, everybody here. Um, we have uh, Megumi, uh, who is a, hi Megumi, uh, is a graduate from um, Ryoko um, University in Toko, Tokyo with a major in early Japanese literature. And we have um, uh, Martin Soderblom Sorelli. Did I say that right, Martin? Yes, he's giving me a hands up. Um, Martin received his PhD from Princeton University and has worked at the Institute of Modern History, Academia Sinesia, Taiwan, Taiwan for the last four years, most recently as an associate research fellow. His research centered on cultural and intellectual history of language in the late imperial China. Previously, he was a postdoctoral -doc fellow at the Max Planck Institute for History of Science in Berlin and was trained in Sweden, France, the UK, South Korea, and China. Wow, Martin, you've gotten around. Um, we also have on hand one of our own, the ABA uh, dealer, um, uh, Jonathan is here. No, Jonathan's not here, I'm sorry. Wait, wait, introduce just yourself. Be It'll just be me. Just It'll be just me. be you. Okay. Introduce yourself, sir. Okay. Well, I'm Yoshi Hill. I'm son of um, Megumi and Jonathan, uh, and we've worked together for seven years, and I'm just here to help out with the Q&A later and the uh, technology aspects of the presentation. The tech guy. I wish I had a tech guy in my office. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we're super excited, uh, and we're hoping that uh, everybody just kind of jumps in for our Wednesday um, talk. And then afterwards, uh, we will be having a Q&A. So um, during during the uh, talk, you can um, write in, write um, some questions, or after um, we're finished, you can also write in or um, raise your hand and we can chat as well. Um, we are gonna be talking about um, uh, Manchu books and Japanese books, um, but they will be explaining more um, in about two seconds. So um, you guys are on mute, so uh, take it away. All right, we'll get started. Wonderful. Um, so we'll open up our PowerPoint and uh, okay, away we go. Okay. Move on. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So thank you very much for joining us today. Martin and Yoshi and then I are very excited to tell you about what is our excitement and the fascination towards the Asian materials and books and manuscripts also. So how Jonathan and I started dealing with Japanese books, it was about 20 years ago, we were at the Tokyo Book Fair. And then Jonathan suddenly started looking at a beautiful Japanese medical books a, uh, with a lot of illustrations and the layout of the page faces are absolutely different, but it has a rhythm that gives us a fascination. And um, we bought them all and then we brought it back and then we start studying about the history of Japanese medicine. These are our covers of the catalogs. We took um, a great pride of our catalogs and then please do visit our website to see the contents and then the images and enjoy reading the description, I hope. And also this time we are showing you a list of uh, our Bibles, the reference books. These are a wonderful help and also um, a great education for us. And um, I hope anyone who's interested in the Japanese materials or Asian materials, please do take a look at them. It will, it will give you and enhance you your interest very much. 
Also, uh, it's crucial is using a databases and then a website. And today we brought out the two examples. The one is the Smithsonian's um, Gerhard uh, Polvora's illustrated book uh, database. A very wonderful and uh, descriptions are uh, absolutely helpful. And then also another one is Japan and the Dutch relationship in the Edo period. This website was created by National Diet Library in Japan. And not only the descriptions and in the historical backgrounds, but when you click it, there is a digital page by page uh, visuals coming up. And it is very important, particularly the Japanese materials. Uh, the seasoned uh, rare booksellers once told us that every Japanese books are unique. Even the titles are same, authorship same, date of a publication same, but you have to check the title page and then the color phone to make sure it's the same publisher. So all these tricks will be helped by all the reference materials. And uh, today we wanted to show you uh, varieties of materials. It could be scrolls, wood blocks, manuscripts, drawings, maps, and a lot more. I hope you will enjoy it. Early Sutra printed at Nara in 1383. This is decades before Gutenberg. And it's not only the significance of existence, but how beautiful they are. They know how to use decorative papers. This papers, I wish you can handle it, you can hold it, because the lightness, the delicate, and the, the lights reflect by the freckles of a gold and silver and the mica sprinkles are wonderful. And inside, uh, the very handsome, bold font with a generous ink. It is, you can feel it, it is the exclusive items for the special occasion. And not to forget, it is very rare to have a frontispiece filled with information. And you can just sit here for many, many hours just learning so many things. So what you can see information from these two pages. This is a very rare Japanese printed movable types. Of course it's printed in movable types. On the right, they have a, a, a piece of paper uh, pasted on. It is where this material item were exhibited. In 1910, in England, they had a world exposition. That was the first Japanese um, participants. And the, the owner, proud to say it was wonderful part of the um, exhibition. And then also the provenance seals. And the next pictures, when you look carefully, there is um, added rubrications by the red pigments, which suggest the end of the sentence. And also, um, also the um, importance of the contents is the fables was used by a Japanese to promote Buddhist principle it being reproduced many, many times. Tall and large wooden training mannequin for acupuncture. When you look closer, there are hundreds of holes and right next to it, there's a name of uh, pressure points. These were used for medical students to study and the doctors to determine what treatments it needed for the patients. And most unusual. And uh, 
So we had several of these Sado scrolls, gold, silver, and then the copper mining on uh, Sado Island, just off the coast of Niigata Prefecture, had its beginning in ancient times. It was essential for the Edo government to support by the, um, the precious metals revenues and um, uh, it, it successfully uh, supported the Edo government for several hundred years. When you look carefully, they are the workers using all the Japanese technological inventions, tools, and techniques of smelting the, uh, the precious metals. Here it is, you can see Archimedes screw derived the water away from the sand area so they can pick the minuscule pieces of a metal, uh, precious metals. This is one of our favorites. On the right, this is the end of, this is the first mathematical books written by women. And the, the end of the preface, you can see they have a um, signature of the writer which is just simply said, Mr. Tyra, which is her last name. And she wanted to leave the signature of her, the circular red seal, it says her first name, Akiko. And she, in, she written in a preface that uh, she learned mathematics from her father, who's a mathematician, and um, uh, she learned quickly from age five, and then she was inspired to continue her mathematical study. She wrote by her to other women. This is considered one of the greatest Japanese illustrated books by Utamaro, eight double page color printed woodcut illustrations luxuriously heightened with gold, metal dust, and an embossing for the shells. I'm sorry that our pictures doesn't show the three-dimensional feel to it, but if you happen to see the same copy, other copies, do take a close look at it. For example, how many colors are applied? Look at the Avaroni shell, how deep and the nuanceful colors. Each colors were created by one wood blocks. So how many wood blocks has been used? It is a mystery for me, but certainly beautiful. One of the several scrolls prepared following the dissections of Heijiro, the name of a person who is a convicted crime, a criminal. Um, we have several of them, and um, this is the one of the earliest human dissections depict in Japan, a milestone moment of a Japanese medical history. Images of progressive stages of the dissections, including all the parts of a body, brains, eyeballs, and these were done by doctors because at the prison yard, doctors were only allowed to be in. Therefore, there's a talented artistic doctor who, who draw all those images. Therefore, the, the information is accurate. Here it is another gorgeous color illustrated box. Um, it is an encyclopedic survey of all the agricultural products and the practices of Japan, accompanied by a splendid series of woodblock colors, many of which are finely, finely chosen colors. Here's the street scenes, the merchants selling the materials. It is a valuable collection of a traditional Japanese knowledge of crops, including vegetables, herbs and trees, agricultural practices, and food uh, uh, 
food uh, preparation methods. Another of our favorites, Commodore Perry's, um, sorry, so-called black ship scrolls. Early manuscript in the scrolls about the American expedition were carefully shared among only the nobles and the government official in Japan. This is the picture, the detailed depict of American ships arrive a long procession you can see the sailors led by a marching band and Commodore Perry is here he's wearing a red jacket following the young two sailors they're carrying a two red boxes contains the official letters from the president to the Japanese emperor. These are various examples of a wood blocks. On the right with the accentuated handle, this is a Korean wood blocks. And Korean supposedly vertically store all these wood blocks, so the handles as a cover of the cabinet also. And on the left, this is an ephemeral quality of kite printing, but at the same time, it is an advertisement of a pub. And there are various examples, but on the left is the heightened, the, the color for the kimono patterns. And then on the right is images and the texture. This is a wonderful examples of mirror image in on the uh, wood blocks that the printed images on the right and the curved images and then it is the details of the willow leaves to the woman's hairs are uh, uh, wonderful to see this is a complete set we had and this is a dictionary for the surnames. And therefore, this is a wonderful example to teach what Japanese books made by and how to construct page by page. This is a completely different material, but it is a shop uh, signboard by the tea store. It says Isaen tea, specialized in the thin green tea powders. And the kanban, we call it, is uh, depict the shape of a large tea storage jar. Colette's sherry, written in J Japanese, the earliest translation of any of her works done by a woman Sumako Hukao, who was um, her, uh, who was a poet also, but translated Colette's pieces, uh, Colette's creation, and she, she loved Colette's uh, work so much. She went to Paris several times to get to know Colette and became a good friend. Our last examples a set of uh, extremely complex models for tea ceremony houses, including the floor plans of the various rooms, uh, along with the pop-up flaps and then the walls, benches, shelves, boxes, and the shutters and the awnings. When you look carefully, the detailed notes providing a measurements, design details, materials, and functions. In Japan, the uh, paper pop-up models uh, has been used at least since the 16th century as a primary means of the communication between carpenters and the patrons. 
particularly in the construction of a tea houses, because the tea houses often was created by tea masters. And the tea masters want to infuse the details of their touch. And to deliver it to the client, it's very crucial to show them 3D images. Thank you very much for joining me and uh, Yoshi. So now we're gonna hand it over to Martin, our colleague. He's gonna talk about Manchu books. Um, let's see if I can share. I, why did I try this and everything worked yesterday? And now I cannot share my screen. Oh, there we go. So uh, now we saw so many exquisite items of Japanese printing and manuscript, and uh, I'm going to take you to uh, the more gritty reality of Manchu books, which is far from as pretty as what we just saw. Uh, so um, I should first uh, say, you know, uh, good day to all of you, greet all of you. And uh, before I start, I want to thank uh, Shin and Lizzie for, for inviting us to this forum. And I thought I would start uh, today's presentation by briefly introducing myself and my background. So some of you just mentioned already, I'm a historian of China by training. And I first came to the United States to do a PhD in Chinese history at Princeton University in 2010. And I had always been very interested in language and languages in history. So I decided to write my PhD dissertation on a, on a language related topic. I had already taken an interest in the Qing period, which was the last period of imperial rule before China became a republic in 1912. Since I was interested in the Qing period and I was interested in language, I naturally gravitated towards studying the Manchu language. The Qing empire was ruled by a Manchu dynasty and the Manchu language played an important role in court life and in the administration of the empire. So I studied Manchu and I wrote a dissertation titled Manchu and the Study of Language in Qing China. My point in this dissertation was to see how Chinese ideas about language and script were influenced by the fact that a totally new language had been introduced to the country with the Qing conquest. After finishing the PhD in 2015, I first spent three years in Berlin as a postdoc, and then four and a half years in Taipei at Academia Sinica. During this time, I wrote two books, and one of them grew out of my dissertation. It was titled The Early Modern Travels of Manchu, A Script and Its Study in East Asia and Europe. The book looked at how Manchu became studied by various groups of outsiders. Manchu erupted on the world historical stage in 1644 when the Manchus invaded China, and for this reason, many people took an interest in the Manchu language. Chinese people studied Manchu, some Koreans did, some Japanese, and some scholars in Russia and Western Europe too. My, my book looked at how individuals in various corners of the world tried to make sense of Manchu. The second book that I wrote during these years uh, is titled The Manchu Language at Court and in the Bureaucracy under the Qianlong Emperor. And this book is scheduled for release in January of 2024. I have to hand in the proofs like in a few days. I have not gotten around to doing that yet. In this book, I studied two things. The first was uh, how the Manchu language was used within the Qing government apparatus in the 18th century. The second was how Manchu at the Qing court in Beijing became used as a tool and as an object of philological scholarship. The book used these examples to counter a trend in earlier scholarship, which had seen the history of Manchu language in China in the 18th century, primarily as a history of decline, the history of the decline of the Manchu language. But I argued instead that the Manchu language was extensively and successfully used in this period, and that the uses to which Manchu was put even grew in the period. While I was in Taiwan working on these research projects, I also started working with Jonathan, Megumi, and Yoshi to catalog Manchu, Chinese, and Korean books. After having done that for, I'd say, about two years, 
we decided that I should join the firm full time. So earlier this year, I moved back to the United States uh, to make my, my passion for East Asian rare books a full time occupation. So here you have my background and the story of how I came to work with these materials. What I will do in the remainder of the presentation is to talk a little bit about what the Manchu language is and what books came to be written in it. So first, a few words about the Manchu language. The Manchu language originated in the southern region of what is today sometimes known as Manchuria or the Chinese Northeast. The early Manchu state existed close to the borders of China and Korea, and you see that area here. So I don't know if you can see clearly, but at the very right, there's an area called Genzhou Jiuchens, and that's the sort of where the Manchus originated. And you have uh, the Great Wall marked there, and then Beijing south of the Great Wall. In terms of its genetic affiliation, Manchu is a Tungusic language. That's to say that Manchu is related to a number of other languages that are or were spoken in what is today's China's three northeastern provinces, as well as in the Russian Far East. And that's to say that Manchu has no genetic affinity with the Chinese language, and it's quite different from Chinese in its morphology and syntax. The closest language to Manchu is, as far as I know, Jurchen, which was the language of the state in the Jin, language of state in the Jin Empire in the 12th and 13th centuries. And in addition, Manchu is structurally similar to Mongolian, which was spoken in close proximity to Manchu and to Jurchen during a long period of time. Mongolian was even used as a written language among Manchu speakers. There are many Mongolian loanwords in Manchu, which means that in addition to being similar in their syntax, Manchu and Mongolian are also to a certain extent similar in their vocabulary. What I want to make clear by saying this is that Manchu was in basically every way very different from Chinese. During its history, Manchu came to exist in a very close proximity to Chinese, including in books but the two languages were basically very different. Manchu became a written language sometime around the turn of the 17th century. This happened by writing down the local spoken language using the classical Mongolian alphabet. And here's an example of what the early Manchu writing looks like. So you see, this is something quite much, much, much messier than the, the beautiful Japanese books we just saw. These are early archival records and they have crossed some things out and added things on the side and so on. In 1644, the Manchus took advantage of great social unrest in China and in, in invaded China. They took Beijing in the same year and established the Qing dynasty there. From 1644 to 1911, China was ruled by the Manchus, who relocated their imperial capital to Beijing. Along with moving the court to Beijing, the Manchus also moved very large number of its troops, the so-called Eight Banners, and which included both soldiers and their dependents. This meant that Beijing, within the city walls, became essentially a city populated by bannermen. And here you have a map showing this. This is what, uh, if you've been to Beijing, this is the area inside the Second Ring Road, which was the area that was inside the Beijing city walls before. And it was all populated by these eight banners, so Manchu soldiers uh, and their dependents. And I said Manchu soldiers now, which is a slight inaccuracy, because these bannermen, they could be of Manchu or they could be of Mongol and Chinese descent, but they to a large degree shared a common culture and the court had similar expectations of them. The Manchu language was probably only spoken natively by the Manchu bannermen, but it became the expectations that male members of the, also of the Mongol and Chinese banners, they should also study Manchu. So bannermen of all three backgrounds published Manchu books. And I'll now turn to Manchu books proper. If one wants to make a sweeping statement, one can say that in a general sense, the history of Manchu books is part of the history of Chinese books. Most Manchu books were written by people who lived in China and who also spoke Chinese. That being the case, when talking about Manchu books, I think there are three characteristics that are important to mention. These characteristics make Manchu books stand out in comparison to Chinese books. The first characteristic is the large number of bilingual or multilingual books. That's to say, very many, probably even most, Manchu books 
contain at least one other language in addition to Manchu. Beijing was a center for Manchu book production, and Beijing was both a Chinese-speaking city and the capital of a vast empire. So for these two reasons, the fact that Beijing was Chinese and that Beijing was also very multicultural, other languages than Manchu made their way into Manchu books. The second characteristic of Manchu books is the very prominent place occupied by works oriented towards language study. Learning written Manchu, and often at the same time learning spoken Manchu, was necessary for any bannerman who wanted any kind of career. And many bannermen took various kinds of examinations that tested them on Manchu translation. For this reason, there was a great interest in language study materials. The third characteristic of Manchu books is the relatively large proportion of manuscripts in comparison with printed books. The reasons for this state of affairs are hard to pin down. There were certainly both government organizations, private individuals, and commercial publishers who did publish Manchu books. Yet still we find such considerable quantities of manuscripts. And some of these manuscripts have the characteristics of books intended for circulation, not just manuscript notebooks for private use. I will now do a kind of show and tell of Manchu books on the basis of this tripartite division. I've chosen to take most of my examples from this book, which I have here too. Uh, or Illustrated Catalogues of Manchu Books and Documents Held at the National Library of China. This is an, an excellent resource when working with Manchu books. Uh, I'll start with bilingual and multilingual books. Uh, but before showing you books containing several languages, I thought I should first show you what a monolingual Manchu book look like, looks like. So here you have the first page of the preface for the Imperial Lectures on the Confucian Book of Documents. This book is from 1680. And as you can see, it is entirely in Manchu. Here's a book from another, a page from another book in the same series. This is a spread from the Imperial Lectures on the Change Classic. The Change Classic is a book known in Chinese as the Yi Jing, which is, you know, a book, it's known for its trigrams and hexagrams. And you see these trigrams glossed in Manchu on the right. Maybe you can recognize some of those uh, trigrams from the flag of uh, the South Korea. They also have taken it from the Yi Jing. So you have this, uh, you have the, the trigrams there, and then there are some glosses in Manchu. So these were used for uh, divination initially, I think. And here you see a Manchu text printed along with a commentary. So this is an edition of the classic of poetry in Manchu translation, published in early 1655. And this text actually has two layers of commentary. The first is what you see on the left, with thin characters printed in single columns. Then on the right, you have a few lines of the main text of the book, which is the thick uh, characters. And then that is followed by double-lined commentary. So you have uh, one column has two lines inside it. And this use of manuscript in double columns to act as a commentary, uh, this reflects a corresponding use in Chinese books. So they mimic the structure of Chinese books here. And as you can see here, the titles that I, mentioned, I just mentioned, they're all Confucian books. And I might mention that all of these were also published by the Qing court. And I think it's safe to say that the majority of Manchu only books, so books that contain only Manchu language material, those books were primarily published in this way by the court and not by commercial publishers. So I'll now turn to uh, bilingual and multilingual books. And here you see a typical example. This is a book of imperial exhortations published in 1867. On the left, you see, uh, what do you see here? On the left, you see the title page, and on the right, you have the first page of text. So it's interesting to note that in these bilingual books, the direction of text goes from left to right, which is the order that's used in Manchu books. Chinese books normally have the text going from right to left, but in bilingual books, the Chinese order yields to the Manchu order. So you have the title in Manchu first on the absolute left, then the title in Chinese, and then the book starts with the text first in Manchu, then Chinese, first then Manchu, then Chinese, and so on. While this kind of bilingual Manchu Chinese book is the most common type of book containing several languages, it's not the only one. Here you have an example of a Manchu book containing four languages. 
this is a copy of a Buddhist sutra, and you have the sutra in Tibetan, Manchu, Mongolian, and Chinese. So you see that the top text there is Tibetan, and then underneath it you have Manchu, and underneath the Manchu there is Mongolian, and then at the very bottom there is the Chinese text. And you see that the Manchu and, and, uh, and Mongolian look very similar. If you don't look closely, you could almost mistake one for the other. And you see also that this format, the format of the book here, is uh, not a codex anymore. So this is like a Tibetan style book where you have loose oblong leaves rather than a bound codex. So here you have a Manchu language appearing in a Tibet Tibetan style book. I'll now turn to books that exhibit the second characteristic that I mentioned, namely books that relate to language study. And here you have a typical pedagogical text. This is a Manchu syllabary, so more or less the equivalent of the, of the alphabet. English alphabet. So again, you have the title page to the left, and then the first page of text on the right. Each Manchu syllable has its pronunciation gloss using Chinese characters. So you can use, if you know Chinese, you can learn how to pronounce the Manchu script using this book. And I believe that this syllable dates from the late 17th century. And uh, there are some indications here that this might have been uh, Commercial commercial publication. I think the big seal there is supposed to make it look very flowery and nice, and perhaps increase the value of the book. Although the publisher itself, uh, we know some about that publisher, and it, I think it might have been unclear if it's a commercial venture or if it's like the venture of a of a rich aficionado. And here is another example of an uh, interesting example of language pedagogy. And this, app, this book actually contains two texts on the same page. So you have a Manchu language text in the upper half of the page, and then you have a glossary in the lower half of the page. And the glossary contains objects along with the names in Manchu and Chinese. So you see the objects depicted there. And for the Chinese names, Manchu glosses have been added to the side, indicating the pronunciation. And for the Manchu names, Chinese characters have been added to indicate the pronunciation. So it appears that this book could be used to learn either Manchu or Chinese as long as the reader already knew one of these two languages. I'll now turn to books that exhibit the, the last characteristic that I mentioned, which is books that are in manuscript rather than in printed form. And as you see in this picture, manuscripts could be very neat. This is a list of regulations for the Directorate of Education in Beijing. And the nice yellow covers of this book, as well as the neat handwriting, give this away as a book that was produced at the Qing Palace. And some of the books that were produced on imperial command at the palace were never printed, but only written up in neat manuscripts like this one. Here you have another neat looking manuscript that's nevertheless of a very different character. This is a chart of how to line up cannons and riflemen for a military display in Inner Mongolia in 1888. As you see, this manuscript has both Manchu and Chinese text, and the text has been written onto yellow slips that have been pasted onto the book. And then you have the drawings of the cannons and the rifles. Here's another manuscript that's also kind of a chart. No, this one, yeah. This is the genealogy of the Bayan family. And what you see here is a family tree. So you have the ancestor and then first generation, second generation, third generation descendants. Uh, and this is a quite an interesting manuscript. As you see, it's written in both Russian and Manchu. And I, while I don't know the exact origins of this manuscript, I suspect that it originates in the School for the Study of Russian that was maintained by the Qing government in Beijing uh, to serve the diplomatic needs of the empire. This manuscript is not dated, uh, but the legend that accompanies it in the illustrated catalog suggests that it's a didactic work of some kind. Uh, this manuscript here is quite beautiful. Uh, I think this is an astronomical and perhaps a meteorological manuscript. As you can see, there are color illustrations of astronomical objects that have the moon and maybe it's the sun or the moon being covered by clouds and then the moon going into an eclipse. Of course, manuscripts could be very messy too. I will end my presentation with this one. This manuscript here gives the history of the Manchu state. The main text is written in Chinese. But on the right-hand side, there are a series of bilingual phrases. Note that this text, too, has the direction of text that's running from left to right, even though Chinese is a dominant language in this uh, manuscript. 
And this manuscript is especially suitable for being the last one in my presentation, since this one is very recent. The authors of the illustrated catalog date this manuscript to the Republican period, so from the period after the Qing Empire fell in 1911. And this manuscript shows that Manchu book culture survived longer than the Manchus did as a political force. Uh, I hope that I've given you a sense of what the Manchu language is and what types of books we find written in it. I identified three characteristics of Manchu books, namely, first, that Manchu books often contain more than one language, two, that many Manchu books were intended to support language study, and three, that the number of Manchu manuscripts that have survived is quite large in proportion to the number of printed books. The books that are presented to you today date from the second half of the 17th century to the first half of the 20th century, spanning 300 years of Manchu book production. I'll end my presentation here, and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, well, we actually have one question so far uh, from Maria Lynn. Um, she was curious, uh, Martin, if had any tips on telling the difference between Manchu and Mongolian apart at the at a glance, as the scripts are very similar. Uh, the second part of her question was, um, is there any elements exclusive to one or the other? Good question. Get right into the nitty gritty. I wish I had a picture prepared, but I haven't. Um, so you can't tell them apart. When the Manchus first started writing down their own, their own language, they initially just used the Mongolian alphabet as it was. And then it looked very similar to Mongolian. But then uh, the Mongolian alphabet doesn't really distinguish um, certain sounds. So you have, you don't know if they have a, something called vowel harmony in Mongolian, which means that uh, all the vowels in one word can be either front vowels or back vowels. So it can be, you can have an A in there, like an A sound, but then if you have an A sound as well, that would be in a different, different vowel register and you cannot have them in the same word. And the two vowels, A and A, would be written in the same way in Mongolian. And then if you know the language, you can see the spelling and you can still figure out how it should be pronounced. But in Manchu, you don't have this uh, same regularity. So if you don't specify if a vowel should be a A or A, then it can be very unclear. So they decided to add some dots, uh, quite similar to those dots we saw also in the Japanese manuscript, dots to the, to the right-hand side of the line of text, which would indicate the, the, the pronunciation of the vowel. And then they did that also for certain consonants. So you have uh, a voiced consonant to be indicated with a dot, and the unvoiced one will have no dot, which is very similar to Japanese. I don't know if that's related, but probably not. Uh, and in Mongolian, you don't have that. So reading Mongolian, I'm not very good at it, but it's like so difficult because if, unless you know Mongolian very well, it's very hard to know how to pronounce anything. So you have to look up like three different pronunciations of any, any word that you find in the dictionary before you find the right one. So, so that's sort of about uh, the differences between Manchu and Mongolian. Okay, I hope, I hope Maria that answers your question. If you have another question, just uh, type it in there. Um, I, I was I said it's, she said it does. Thank you so much. I know she's uh, been looking into this. Um, I have actually have a question. Um, uh, to me, um, how did you know it was um, the first woman? With with the uh, example that you showed, the the mathematics the mathematic book? books, yeah, yeah, yeah. just wondering. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we looked into a few of the databases and looked for comparable mm -hmm. books. Um, but it's the actually on the National Diet Library catalog, isn't it ascribed? It's attributed to her father. Mm -hmm. um, but we we read it more closely, yeah. and um, you can see that the text is largely hers. Mm -hmm. It's just I believe for to make it suitable for publication. Um, it had to be under her father's name, who was also a mathematician and uh, more more recognized. Okay, so you, it would have it would have to be under somebody else's name. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Um, nobody is asking any question. Anybody? I see all these people up here, <laughs> coming up and uh, showing their name. Is anybody uh, want to raise their hand and ask a question? Everybody's being shy today.
We have a question there. Someone has raised their hand. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm on the wrong page then. Shin? Or Beth, you can go ahead too, but please. Okay, I will. I was. I absolutely love the colors in the books, in the illustrations. And so can you tell me, were they printed? Were they painted? And do you have the recipes for the paints, for the inks? Ooh, good one. Um, and and now, which which book in particular are you referring to? Do you remember which? which oh, one? was it, it was one of, the er, the, one of the early ones that you presented? Um, okay. It had greens in it, and they were very very faint. But the but all the vibrant colors too. I mean, I'm I'm interested in the illustrations. Sure. Well, yeah. um, my mom mentioned that um, each color has its own wood block, mm -hmm. so each detail was done with a separate wood block. Um, and with regards to the inks, we we have not gotten that that far. We don't really know what kind of um, of kind of uh, ingredients there were to make the inks. So I can't really can't really help you there. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've got another one right here. Go ahead, Nina. Hi, uh, this is Nina Musinski. Um, that was fascinating, both of those presentations. Thank you so much. Um, about the Manchu books, I'd love to know a little bit more about uh, the production methods. Were they, these were all done in like studios, um, wood, wood block cutting studios. How were they produced? I sound very ignorant, but uh, <laughs> please. <laughs> Uh, Martin. Yes, we'll we'll let Martin field that one. Okay, he doesn't seem if he's. He wants to come back. Let's see. Martin, come back to us, please. <laughs> You're not done, Martin. Oh, well, and asking me now. I just left. It. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, that was much to be Martin. Martin. You're still. You're still on. We need you. Did you hear the question, Martin? No, oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. I had to step outside. Oh, Nina, can you ask that again? Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, it was just about the production methods of the Manchu books. The, um, they were cut by woodcutters, I assume, right? Or yeah. who knew all the languages or just? <laughs> Good question. We, we know very little about it. It was definitely done by woodblock printing. There was no movable type for Manchu, which is funny, even though it's kind of like an alphabet. Uh, we don't have any movable type, which we do have for Chinese. Uh, and uh, I, the centers of Manchu book production, Manchu printing, was really in some of the banner garrisons, so military garrisons around the empire, uh, and then or in uh, in Beijing. And in those locations, you had plenty of people who knew would have known Manchu, so they could have uh, carved the book. But uh, in principle, you wouldn't really need to know Manchu in order to carve it, since you would first have a sheet of paper that you would, uh, that would be, as I understand it, destroyed in the process of carving. So you could just, you know, uh, it had, you have the text traced already, and you just carve it into the block. And we do see some books that has very strange Manchu, which is like maybe the, 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 the carver didn't know, and no one knew, and no one was able to check. And then maybe they copied one book, and then they made a new edition, copied that, copied that, copied that, and at the end of the day, you have something that looks vaguely like Manchu, but when you look closely, it's uh, it's not Manchu at all. So there are examples of incompetent carvers, but I mean these those examples are rare. And the, all the books I showed you, the Manchu is all very very uh, legible and uh, must have done at least someone in the, in the production process must have been quite familiar with the language. Did that uh, answer your question, Nina? Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we can we can feel the uh, Kate's question from the chat about the back to the um, tea house pop up models. It's a real mouthful, but my mom can can explain a little bit further. Mm. Yeah. So her question was how rare it is that the pop up architectural tea house material. As far as concerned, I think it's really rare, and not many of the bibliographical informations or anything exist. And also time to time we see incomplete set because that this one comes with a 90 envelopes in two wooden boxes. 
And what intrigued us was it is complete. So, and then the, another question from her was, are there any other examples? Not that we've seen, but Nothing. things like this are so ephemeral, ephemeral in, in nature that mm. I think they just don't survive. And, you know, as soon as something comes up and, and disproves that, we'll eagerly share it with you. Um, but for now, we've only seen mm. these tea house models. And wow. I think, yeah, That's Jesse perfect. is next. Yeah, Jesse has a question. Hi. Yeah. Great talk. It was really, really fascinating. Um, everyone on the panel is fantastic. Um, I have a question about the relationship uh, between uh, Japanese publishing and Japanese printing. I know, you know, in Western uh, printing history, you know, the, the publisher and printer are not always one and the same. So uh, I'm wondering if there are sort of uh, similar dynamics going on in uh, Japanese book production and um, if there are major differences, uh, do they proceed or, or does that come after, um, you know, uh, there's more of a, 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 a sort of interaction between Western and, and Eastern printing? Um, it's, it's, yeah, the Japanese model varies a lot. There's a book um, that was put out, I think, last year by Julie Nelson Davis at UPenn. And that goes really in depth into the actual uh, beginning and end of making a book, an illustrated book. Um, so we'd highly recommend, I don't have the title off the top of my head, um, but I think the paradigm is quite different um, between the East and the West. I, concrete examples aren't really coming to mind right now, um, but you'll see um, how many publishing firms there were. I think the barrier to entry in Japan was a lot lower. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are a lot more and Japanese print culture was so vibrant mm -hmm. um, from early on in the Edo period. Uh, the, and, but then also censorship comes in um, those kinds of dynamics. Anything you also, want to add? Also the, uh, uh, amongst our list of uh, reference books, they have a Koniki yeah. um, uh, book of Japan also. Yeah. It's, it touches a lot about the names of the publishers in regional, um, strings that the uh, certain types of publication was created in Kansai, the Kyoto and Osaka, rather than Edo. And then they have some sort of a classification that's more academic books starts publishing in uh, Osaka and Kyoto. I don't know why, maybe the uh, uh, Kyoto was the capital and Nara Kyoto was capital with the aristocratic lineage and its supporters. So I think he, yeah. Kornicki's we'll, books. We'll point you in the direction of Peter Kornicki's book, which is in our list of references. We're happy to share with everyone. Um, but he will discuss and explain it far more eloquently than we could possibly um, for a good understanding <laughs> of Japanese so. print history. So I hope that, that we did our best here. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I really appreciate y'all. Thank you, Jesse. Um, somebody asked, uh, Krista Walk asked, um, it is outside Martin's field of expertise, but I'm curious if there are books with comparisons of Russian and Mongolian from period of Mongol rule of Russia in the 13th to 16th centuries. Thanks for this question. This is a great question. And it is it is a bit outside my field of expertise, but I, I can speculate a little bit. I mean, I don't, because I did look into the history of the Manchu script and Mongolian script in uh, in Europe, and uh, of course, I was looking at in the post Manchu post Manchu period, so after sixteen forty four, and uh, it does not appear to me that scholars writing in Russia at that time had access to earlier comparisons with Mongolia. Uh, the Russians uh, sent caravans to to Beijing in this period, in the Qing period, and they uh, had sent people to study uh, Chinese and Manchu in Beijing. And those people brought back Manchu uh, books and, and, uh, and manuscripts to St. Petersburg in the 18th century, or already in the early 18th century. At the same time, there you had the Kalmyk Mongols in the south of, uh, of, of, of Russia, who you also you also had some Mongolian documents, and that those documents sort of appear uh, uh, to, in, in, for the uh, to come to the attention of scholars in that period. I think we were talking about the first half of the 18th century, 
And to me, we having looked at that material, it seems to me that there was, there was new to them. They had not seen this stuff before and they tried to figure out the differences between Manchu and Mongolian and between Manchu and Mongol people was also not very clear at that time. Uh, and uh, in, in no, in the, at least in those discussions, not, no references came up to earlier R Russian comparisons with Mongolian from the period of Mongol rule. So if that existed, it was at least uh, already unknown to scholars uh, in Russia in the early 18th century. But it is, of course, possible that something like that exists, it's just that I'm not aware of it. I think that the early examples of Mongolian writing, like from the, from the Mongol Empire that you have in, in Western collections, they are like state letters sent to, West, to Western rulers. So you have like some Mongolian documents in the National Library of France that were sent to the French king, I think, or to the Pope, uh, written in Mongolian. And those are very rare because we, we have no such documents left in China from the period of Mongol rule. Wow. Um, anybody else? Do we have any more questions? Or are we going to wrap this up? Doesn't look like it. Um, do you guys want to finish off with anything or? Um... Um, nothing in particular. If that if that's all for the questions, uh, we're just happy to have, uh, you know be able to share yeah. some of our our expertise. And um, yeah, uh, we're always happy, eager to discuss you know uh, certain collecting priorities, uh, our catalogs. We're always you know desperate to get them out the door. So um, you know if you're at all interested, just just uh, send us an email. Um, and yeah, yeah, hope hope to, this uh, inspires you guys to look into Asian books and materials. Um, and yeah, be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you all of you for uh, coming for our Wednesday chat. This was great. Um, I enjoyed it tremendously. Uh, and thanks everybody for coming and uh, hope to see you soon. If anybody has any other interesting ideas for a chat for our Wednesday brown bag lunch, get in touch with us at the ABA headquarters. Thanks again. <laughs>